Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. And I'm Adam, your co-host. This week, we're going to bring you a technical episode. We have talked about a lot of security features in Windows, and we're going to start a series about the specific features and dive into them and kind of explain how they work and why you should enable them. So this is the first of many episodes covering security tools in Windows, and today we're going to cover Windows Defender Credential Guard. And this is a great place to lead off because it's super important. Everybody should turn on Credential Guard or Cred Guard. You may have, hear it referred to if you at all can. But there might be a question of, okay, I didn't even know about this. Like, how come Microsoft doesn't do more to kind of advertise all of the security features in Windows, like Cred Guard, like App Guard, like Attack Surface Reduction? And kind of the answer to that is, you know, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit of how the sausage is made. Ultimately, if you as a customer have already purchased Windows, like Windows Enterprise, which is where a lot of these capabilities live, by the way, you actually have to have Windows Enterprise licensing and not just Windows Pro. Um, once you've bought that, you know, obviously there isn't really a, a team that's trying to get you to, to like buy it again. You've already bought it. And from that perspective, there may also not be a lot of um, people kind of pushing you to like deploy all the individual security features in windows because ultimately there's so much there and organizations have so many different needs that you're just not going to get a lot of like proactive support from your Microsoft team banging down your door to get you to like, Hey, you know, come deploy cred guard, app guard, attack service reduction, windows low for business. Like that's all there. And there's absolutely a support system in place to help you get those deployed if you have interest. But as far as having that intent to deploy, that really kind of has to come from your side. And so that's why we're doing the show to enlighten our listeners who are security practitioners at enterprises and large organizations and all sizes of organizations that you own a lot of this stuff that can help make your business more secure and you should get this rolled out. And if you don't have the expertise to do it by yourself, you can talk to your Microsoft account team, your customer success account manager, if you have one, and there's resources to help you get deployed. Maybe also a modern work architect can help you get some of this stuff deployed if you have one of those. And if you have neither, then there's many Microsoft partners like uh, an Ascent or a Netrix or many, many others that are really good at helping you get these deployed. So we're just here to kind of tell you what it is, how it works, why you want it what it helps secure from your organization perspective. But if you've ever wondered, like, again, like, why doesn't Microsoft push this on me more? Why aren't they telling me about this? Why aren't they like banging down the door and making me deploy this stuff? This is kind of why it's, it's one of those, like you already bought windows enterprise, you get all this stuff and nobody needs everything in windows enterprise, right? It's it's, there's a couple of features that are really important to you. Um, but as security practitioners, I think there's a lot of really, really valuable stuff here. And as we do this series of shows, which by the way, they're not all going to be back to back. We're not going to record, you know, week after week after week of built in windows OS stuff. But as we revisit this, hopefully this plants the seed with you to put this on your roadmap to deploy some of these technologies. Like everybody who listens to this show, unless you have a technical blocker that prevents you should put it on your security roadmap to get credential guard deployed. And as Andy kind of walks you through what it is and why you need it. And I add some color commentary where I can, hopefully you see that from today's conversation. So just wanted to kind of mention that up front, give you some context and some understanding around where these solutions live and, and maybe why you haven't heard about some of them. But with that, let's get started talking about cred guard. What is it, Andy? And, and why would people want it? So it's a feature that was introduced in Windows 10 Enterprise and Server 2016. So it's been around for a while. And from a 5,000 foot level, essentially what it does is it uses a virtualization based security to isolate 
secrets, and I put secrets in quotes here, so that privileged software from the system can access it. Essentially, in layman's terms, it protects credentials that are being used by Windows for single sign-on and prevents that from being stolen and used on other machines. There are a bunch of different types of attacks that directly utilize this type of vector. For example, pass the hash, pass the ticket. Those are things that are prevalent in the security world where attackers will use the cached hash of a user's password to then authenticate to another computer. Because when you log into Windows, you essentially cache that password in the system and then it stores it as a hash, which is then able to be read by other computers. So CredGuard basically prevents all of these. It protects the NTLM password hashes, the Kerberos ticket granting tickets, and the credentials that are stored in applications. We're going to go through this whole thing, and what I'll tell you is, prior to this, before doing this episode and researching it, I had about a 100-level basic understanding from a tech technical aspect to this process and we're going to try to bring you up to maybe like a 200 level understanding this is by no means like a complete technical deep dive because domain level authentication is very very complicated when you get into it but i'm going to try to explain to the best of my ability from a intermediate level how all of this works when I was looking at the pre-show notes that Andy and I kind of discussed before we go on the air, so to speak, I was mentioning to him that a lot of this stuff is already kind of over my head. And so don't feel kind of left out or embarrassed if, if some of this is, is not familiar to you as well. I think we use a lot of technologies like Kerberos day in and day out without really understanding like how it functions at a technical level. And some people do, and that's great, you know, good for you um, for having that understanding. But for a lot of us, it's kind of this magic thing where I type a password and then I get tickets and, and I get single sign on to things and everything works and it's beautiful. Um, but there's also some limitations with it because Kerberos is honestly really old and there have been some challenges with that. And, and you'll kind of understand those as we go through it today. So uh, hopefully you learn as much as I did and Andy did as we have today's discussion. So I put quotes around secrets because what secrets are we trying to protect? So first and foremost, obviously, you type in your password into Windows. And when you type in your password, you get a TGT from Kerberos, otherwise known as a ticket granting ticket, or other, also otherwise known as a Kerberos authentication ticket. There's a bunch of different words for it. And what that is is that's a small file that provides access to data exchange. A TGT is considered more secure because it's encrypted. It has the client IP address, the lifetime of the TGT, the previously generated session key, and it also prevents a man-in-the-middle attack. The TGT then gets a session key, which gives you access to service tickets, Kerberos service tickets. The Kerberos service tickets are the ones that grant access to application services like HTTP, SSH, that are running on servers or the workstations. And since those services are protected resources, you have to prove your identity to that service by providing a Kerberos service ticket, which is given to you from the session key that is in the TGT. So we were explaining this whole thing because CredGuard kind of inserts itself into this whole process. What I've just explained is kind of the original ticket, Kerberos ticket system and how it works, the whole process. So when there's an attack, what is typically the whole chain, right? A user logs in to Windows with their password. Maybe they download something or they go to a malicious site or whatever it is, whatever the vector of attack is, there's some sort of process that's run that, that we'll call it, the malicious process. It could be an XE, it could be something else. That process then finds some sort of escalation of privilege. Maybe it sees the logged in user and then it uses that logged in user to find another computer that has an admin who's logged in and then the admin will then escalate to system 
And then once you have system on anything, it can read everything that's in memory. And so that's really bad. There's also legacy undocumented APIs that are there in the wild that we know about that can read these secrets as well. Some things like Java apps that have SSO that passed in the user secrets automatically from Windows, they have access to the TGT session key as well. So there's numerous ones out there. There's also something built into Windows called Credential Manager. For example, when you receive a prompt, like say from an RDP session, and it has a little checkbox that says, would you like to save this credential? And you hit OK. That automatically saves it into Credman. And if you look up Credential Manager on a Windows computer, you go to it and you can literally click on the little eyeball and reveal the clear text password. Now, it does ask you to authenticate, but imagine your system, right? If you're running everything a system, you can just go to Credman and those credentials are stored there. So a lot of this is legacy, right? And that was used at some time and we needed it, but security wasn't built in. So what happened is that we tried to, and by we, I mean Microsoft, tried to protect the LSAS process. There was a first pass at this, and they designed something called the LSA, LSAS protected process, or LS or LSAPP. And so what that did was it prevented anything in the LSA process from getting loaded into that that wasn't signed by a special certificate authority that was digitally signed by Microsoft. And the LSA process or the local security authority is the central component of the security subsystem in Windows. That includes the LSAS XE, which is LSASS.exe. That process validates users, enforces all local security processes. If you intentionally kill the LSAS XE, it will then revoke all credentials from the NT authority and reboot your system automatically. And a lot of old malware used to basically fake or run this XE because it's so critical. It would run it out of a different folder or try to fake it through malware and essentially try to steal credentials that way. The LSAS process is responsible for all interactive logins into Windows. So essentially, when a, window, when a user logs in locally, they enter in a username and password. That invokes the LSA process. It passes the credentials to the SAM manager, security account manager, which has the information stored, cached in the SAM database. That's your local database on the computer. SAM database compares it to the user credentials with the account information that's entered in. And if you're in there, you're authorized to use the system. So the LSAS grants the user an access token, and then you're able to access all the resources once you've been authenticated. The protected process, again, prevents anything from being injected into the LSA process without being signed. And that was a huge win because that was an attack vector in, in the olden days where they would try to inject things into the LSAS process because it wasn't protected. Then they protected it with the signed CA. However, if you're able to compromise the kernel, you're able to turn off the LSA protected process with a flip of a bit. So that's bad. How it evolved is Credential Guard. So how does the kernel work and how do you get that talking? So essentially... The kernel talks to hardware and has access to everything, right? That's in the beginning. In the beginning, <laughs> the kernel has access to everything. And then someone created something called the hypervisor. And what the hypervisor is, is a tiny little thing that acts as a mediator between the hardware and the OS so that it can stay 
essentially isolated from each other, right? So one VM cannot look into another VM when they're running on the hypervisor through this mediator. It can't look at processes. It can't communicate except through an external stack like an Ethernet. It's complete isolation. So once the hypervisor was invented, someone had the smart idea of, why don't we put all the critical security stuff into a VM? If you're not aware, modern Windows actually runs on a Hyper-V hypervisor. So essentially, it's a VM-ish. It's not a VM in the traditional sense that we think of a VM, but it doesn't run fully on bare metal. The kernel doesn't run fully on bare metal. There is a hypervisor, Hyper-V, in between the hardware and the actual resources. So the, the security stuff someone invented to put that stuff into VM is called virtual security mode or virtualization-based security. When you enable this in Windows, you essentially are running two VMs side by side. Again, they're not traditional VMs. They're like hybrid VMs. They run in different modes on the same Windows installation. Except one is more locked down than the other one, the, the one with the security stuff in it. So these VMs are isolated from each other into things that are called virtual trust levels. Your user VM, so your normal VM that you're running all of your apps in, your user, that's called VTL0. Your kernel, your LSA, your Explorer, your browser, all that stuff runs in VTL0. When you have virtualization-based security enabled, you have another VM that is next to it called VTL1. And so that's your secure world. And essentially, it's the same thing, except it is specialized specifically for a purpose, which is to authenticate your stuff for credential guard and some other security things. Now, before you go any deeper on this, just a little kind of color commentary here. Obviously, hypervisor-based security is a relatively newer kind of concept where we can isolate different, like you said, kind of virtual machines and prevent them from having any visibility into each other. And this is a foundational concept of cloud computing, right? When you run a virtual machine in Azure or Google Cloud Platform or in AWS, there's an assumption that anything in your VM is isolated from any other VM and any other customer, right? And that is kind of foundational to a lot of what we do today in technology. Now, I'm not saying this is perfect because nothing in security is perfect. And the moment you make claims like that is when you get you know, into trouble. But it is worth pointing out that this technology is used at scale to deliver Azure services to many, many, many different customers. This is the foundational concept of how you can have a shared cloud computing environment where technically many different customers are running on a single piece of hardware and there is no escape and no visibility into each other's environments. And again, of course, that is kind of the holy grail of, of hacking would be to escape a hypervisor and have visibility into VMs that are running on the same hardware. But this is, as it exists today, a relatively strong form of security where we create that isolation and it works relatively well. So just kind of pointing out here that as we have this discussion around Hyper-V and virtualization-based security, which really does help harden Windows, know that that technology, very similar technology, is used at scale as the underlying Azure service fabric, which is, again, you know, the clear number two cloud computing provider in the world and, you know, gaining ground on AWS every month. Um, it's a big deal, and it's, it's something that's used broadly um, to help keep different enterprises data isolated and secure from each other. And so if it works for them, you know, in theory, hopefully it would work on your individual endpoints as well. Of course, there's always that cat and mouse game with attackers, but it's um, right now hypervisor based security works relatively well. It's pretty, pretty strong. Although um, VMware has had some issues lately and I'm sure those will get patched up and addressed quickly too. So, yeah. So this is a concept that for me was, 
a little bit hard to wrap my head around because you're essentially running the two VMs, these hybrid VMs that are next to each other. One is your user one, and this is on your workstation in Windows 10 on your endpoint. Mm -hmm. So once you have these two VMs and you're getting this special security VM by enabling Credential Guard essentially, right? So that moves the secrets that we talked about in the beginning out of the VTL0, the user VM, into the VTL1, the special security VM, we'll call it. And when that happens, Credential Guard has something called the LSA LSO.exe. So in the user one, when we talked about the LSAS process, there was the LSAS.exe. Credential Guard uses something called the LSA LSO.exe. And it's an isolated version of the LSA process. And it only lives in VTL1. So when VTL1, the special secret VM, starts up, it starts the LSA process in VTL0. There is a special communication channel between the two VMs that is secure and locked down, and only the VTL0 system services can communicate on it, which LSAS is one of those services that can communicate over this super secure channel that talks between VTL0 and VTL1. So when VTL0, I'm sorry, when VTL1 starts up, it checks and starts up LSA. LSA will check to see if Credential Guard is enabled. If it is, then it'll do some some special things. So let's go through how it's different. We talked in the beginning about how the original TGT and session tokens and how those work. So when you have Credential Guard, how does it work? User logs in with a password. Password is passed to the LSA. LSA checks to see if Credential Guard is enabled. If it is, the LSA passes the password off to Credential Guard. And what Credential Guard does is, again, that's in VTL1, totally different VM. It encrypts it using the password, and then it dumps out an encrypted blob with a handle to the secret. And from there, you never see the secret ever again. Right, The secret is the password that was passed to it. LSAS then gets the encrypted blob. They passes it over to KDC, which is the key distribution center. And we didn't talk too much about the KDC, but that's where Kerberos actually issues out all the tickets. So LSAS passes the encrypted blob to the KDC, and the KDC does its normal thing. It returns a, a TGT encrypted using the user's password. But because LSAS doesn't have the password anymore, right? The secret was tossed out. They don't have it anymore. LSAS then passes the encrypted blob back to Credential Guard with the handle that it got initially to decrypt the secret, right? So it gets this encrypted blob, gives it to Credential Guard. Credential Guard decrypts it, and it gives it back with all the important things except for the TGT session key. It returns a session key, but the key is encrypted using a key only known to Credential Guard. So even if someone stole the encrypted blob, they wouldn't know what to do with it because they don't have the TGT session key. So LSAS now has the TGT with the session key, but the session key is encrypted only to Credential Guard. It passes that off back to uh to the KDC to try to get a service ticket. The KDC responds with a service ticket that's encrypted using the TGT session key. And of course, LSAS can't do anything with this encrypted blob with, because it doesn't have the key to the session key. Only Credential Guard does. So what does it do? It passes that service ticket that's encrypted using the session key over to Credential Guard. Credential Guard then decrypts it decrypts the service ticket back to LSAS, and then LSAS has the service ticket, which the app needs, and you pass the service ticket to the app, and you gain access. So a lot more things happening than just getting the TGT, getting the session key, getting the service ticket, right? Because that was in the beginning. Now everything has to go through Credential Guard, and Credential Guard essentially encrypts everything in the process so that the LSAS 
process cannot read it. So even if an attacker had access to the user VM, all the stuff that's coming back from Credential Guard cannot be read, and you have to have access to Credential Guard in order to gain, you know, decrypt all the information. So in a nutshell, that is exactly what Cred Guard does, right? You ask it something, and it gives you something back. But you have to ask it the right question. So legacy APIs, like what we talked about in the beginning, where they're passing in different information from the OS, they can ask those questions, but because they're not supplying the right things to Credential Guard, they're going to get back something that they're not going to understand. Other things are just completely broken by design. For example, MS Chap. It's a legacy authentication protocol that makes it really, really easy to reverse the password through crypto analysis. And that's just blocked because it breaks the guarantee that Credential Guard provides. I thought you were very generous by saying legacy APIs and not like hacks and private APIs, because that's kind of more what you're getting at really is, is when people are doing hacky things like you talked about Java was essentially kind of reading memory to give you a single sign on experience. Like that's bad design. Don't do that. Of course. Right. Like call the API appropriately to get the correct results. And then you kind of get forward compatibility when new things are added on like credential guards. So some things may break um, and some Wi-Fi pro protocols may not work. That's work worth investing in because this essentially breaks lateral movement, at least easy lateral movement for most attackers, because, you know, that's so foundational with the explosion of ransomware and everything. If, if we could prevent the threat actors from gaining lateral movement, it makes the attack so expensive and so effortful that it's not worth it. Um, they, they would rather spend their time, go break into, you know, we talk about this a lot where uh, a lot of like cybersecurity isn't necessarily turning your environment into Fort Knox. It's making it more unattractive to break into than the, the organization next door. Right. And this is one of those things. Like if you have cred guard turned on lateral movement becomes so difficult because Mimi cats is broken past the has past the ticket are all broken that attackers can like, man, this isn't worth it. Let's go, let's go find somebody else who doesn't have this turned on because unfortunately this is not as broadly deployed as it should be, or as it, I would like it to be. And it's not a bulletproof system by any means, but it does add and harden in a meaningful way. It is not, we have fixed all of the issues with Kerberos and Kerberos is now the, you know, most secure authentication method in the world. It's not that, but what it is, is it's a meaningful improvement on a system that still maintains a significant amount of legacy compatibility and backwards compatibility while at the same time putting you in a way better place than you were before. And so um, certainly not enough people have deployed this yet. And, and I said at the top of the show, we're going to really encourage you put this on your security roadmap on your security to do's and start working through the process to get it done because this might break some legacy app that a business unit uses in your organization. You're going to need to work through like, how can we address this? It might break how you can connect to Wi-Fi today. And that's something that can be worked through, but you need time to make that change in your Wi-Fi environment first before you turn this on. So it, it could be a journey. It might be easy. You know, this is something you can certainly test out too, because uh, that kind of leads into our very next topic. How do we get this deployed, Andy? How do I how do I turn this on on in individual devices? Is this a all or nothing thing, or can I pilot this with just a couple of users and a couple of machines? What's it look like? Yeah, you can absolutely turn it on just on your individual machine, right? You could. There's a steps that you can walk through to manually turn it on with some settings. You, there's a registry modification. You can enable it through local GPO. You can also, of course, deploy it through GPO in your domain. When you do GPO through your domain, let's say you scope it out, it's great for a pilot, but not for broad deployment because you have to scope it to specific OUs and you have to have a dedicated GPO object. It's filtered using an AD group or some sort of uh, OU target level. And then you have to like manipulate computers to that OU. So not great for broad deployment, 
but for testing, not too bad. If you're traditionally managed on-prem and you're going to deploy this broadly or even in test, I would suggest using ConfigMan because with ConfigMan, you can com configure a configuration baseline and then you can use collections within ConfigMan to target specific machines or filter them and then target those and then, of course, remove it if need to. Um, one bit of advice is when you deploy CredGuard to a machine, it's really, really easy to turn on. It is a lot more difficult to turn off manually. There's a script that you can run to turn it off, but because you're essentially turning on virtualization based, those VMs that we're talking about, you have to essentially decommission those, and it's a it's a process. So if you find that it breaks, you know, you want to test these on users and apps that will have lesser of an impact if something breaks so that you can walk them through on how to reverse that or get a test machine to do the, the whole testing of credit card. And of course, with modern management, you can deploy this through Intune, which is super easy. There's a Windows configuration policy that you can configure. It's literally a checkbox that says turn on Windows Defender Credential Guard, and it does the configuration for you. So one thing that we talked about near the end was some of the compatibility challenges. And certainly, like, if it's org-wide, like Wi-Fi, that's, that's a blocker. But if it's a business unit that uses this ancient, you know, 1998 Visual Basic app or something that, you know, <laughs> does something silly, let me just put, out, put this out there. In general, in security, sometimes we allow those to become blockers and we don't deploy it at all. Don't do that. And he just talked about, you can scope this, you can get it for as many users as you possibly can. Breaking transmission chains or lateral movement chains, hey, we learned about this with vaccines, is still valuable, right? Anytime you can break the ability to move laterally, even if it's not for everyone in your org, but if it's for 95% coverage, that is still a huge win. So do not allow ancient 1998 application for one of your business units from preventing you from deploying it to everybody else. Get this deployed to as many machines as you can, as fast as you can, after, of course, doing your due diligence and testing. But this is a huge security win. This really, really helps. There's no cost if you own Windows Enterprise at all, E3, any, any level on up from there. So strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to look at this and look forward to doing more of these shows and, and covering some of these other cool technologies like attack surface reduction and AppGuard and... Um, there's, there's more to come for sure. And that's it on credential guard. I mean, it's a super small feature, one of many security features within windows 10. But for me, it's one of my favorite ones because for the most part in smaller organizations, if you don't have those legacy applications, you're using TLS for Wi-Fi and all the modern things. It's very, very easy to turn on and it, immediately hardens the OS. So really, really useful tool for protecting the entire authentication process for Kerberos. So like Adam said, test it, get it deployed to as many users as possible, all if at all possible. And, you know, it's super, super important. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for listening, as always. Our contact information is in the show notes. I'll put some documentation in there as well for Windows Defender Credential Guard. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode. <laughs>